Good evening and, and welcome uh, to the 2017 annual meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies. I'm Pauline Yu, president of ACLS, and I'm delighted to see all of you here. As many of you know, perhaps most of you, our annual meeting combines constitutionally mandated governance sessions, reports on ACLS programs, uh, and sessions such as the panel soon to follow, designed to foreground issues and innovations in the humanities today. By bringing together delegates of our learned societies, the society's executives, their elected leaders, ACLS fellows, panelists, re uh, reviewers, board members, representatives of our college and university associates, co colleagues from partner organizations, and friends of ACLS, we aim to create an occasion for taking both a broad and a long view of the humanities today as they advance in intellectual power and social utility. The executive committee of the delegates to ACLS helps to shape the design of each year's meeting. They take very seriously the feedback they receive from attendees, and this year have suggested several efforts to allow for more collective discussion and heightened focus on the work of our societies themselves. So you'll have noticed, I hope, that our schedule uh, for tonight and tomorrow includes more events that are conversations, uh, including tomorrow's with Mellon Foundation President Earl Lewis and the uh, breakout sessions to follow, and tonight's opening discussion. It was the committee that framed tonight's topic. We want to keep a quick pace, and we're already a few minutes late, so I'll save my remarks for my report tomorrow at 9 a.m. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm really happy to see you all here and pleased to be able to facilitate this conversation. Instead of introducing our distinguished guests at length, I refer you to their impressive and extensive biographies in your program. And we'd like to start by a rapprochement to the topic at hand and ask each of our speakers to just take a few minutes and give their initial thoughts on the topic, which, as Pauline uh, noted, the uh, executive committee of the delegates uh, chose for our uh, opening session. So the theme, who speaks, who listens, the academy and the community, memory and justice is the theme. And particularly appropriate since we're about three and a half miles and two, and two years plus a month from when Freddie Gray was arrested and brutalized and um, uh, killed uh, in what the uh, medical examiner called a homicide, uh, which um, obviously led to the Baltimore uprising. So it's a particularly important place and memory and justice moment to start us off. So uh, we're going to uh, start with uh, President uh, John uh, DeJoya and then uh, go to uh, uh, Nicole King. And finally, uh, we will hear from uh, Denise uh, Griffin Johnson. So Jack, would you like to start? Sure, sure, thank you very much. And I'm honored to have this opportunity to be with you all and to share a perspective on, on, on the topic. I think uh, the point of entry for me and, and our conversation this evening is an experience that Georgetown has been engaged in over the course of roughly the last year and a half to two years. Um, it, it begins with um, sort of a routine renovation of an old building on our campus. And the building had a name on it. And uh, we've known our history for a long time. Um, we know that not far from here, in the early half of the 19th century, the religious order that was really responsible for Georgetown University, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, had four plantations um, in Southern Maryland. And in 1838, uh, the person responsible for, those, for, for the society uh, uh, arranged for a sale of 272 enslaved children, women, and men from those plantations to a, um, to a landowner in Louisiana. And that history has been uh, well chronicled. Um, we've taught that history over the course of many years. Uh, the historian who really discovered all of this developed a course uh, that was a, a very important part of, our, our, of the experience on our campus 
20 and 30 years ago. In fact, one of our earliest digital humanities websites was placing all of the materials involved with the sale um, on our web, and we put that up in the mid-1990s. But this building had a name on it, and the building was named for the gentleman who was responsible for the sale. And given some of what was unfolding in our country, and I hope we can talk more about that in the course of our conversation this evening, it was my best judgment that we really needed to re-examine um, re that name as we were going to reopen the building after some extensive renovations. And so in um, this early part of, of August 2015, I established a working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. And I asked the working group to help us come to terms with that history and to determine what we should do with these buildings and what, el what other kinds of engagements might be appropriate. That journey has been a, an incredible one, filled with surprises that we had not anticipated. And uh, I'll be happy to get into that as we, as we get into our conversation tonight. Great, thanks Jack. Nicole? Hi, good evening and welcome to Baltimore. Um, I am in the Department of American Studies at UMBC and I do research and teach public humanities courses on how the city of Baltimore changes over time, um, which of course is a historical endeavor, um, but I also see it as an emotional endeavor um, because the practice that I do involves interviewing and ask, asking people how they remember changes to the city um, and how they feel about those changes to the city. Um, I started a project funded by a Rabowski Innovation Grant um, in spring of 2015 with a colleague in Media and Communication Studies. It's called Baltimore Traces, Communities in Transition. We partnered with a local public radio um, host, Mark Steiner um, of WEAA, um, and students uh, went out into the community and did interviews. Um, part of the, the idea behind this course was to get the voices and to understand what's going on on the ground and in the streets. This project began, as I said, in spring of 2015, and the uprising occurred in spring of 2015. Um, and my students had read Baltimore 68, an edited collection, or engaged in doing interviews in the community and I really see Baltimore Traces, um, the project and the work that we do in public humanities is a radical experiment in listening to a city. And I see that as part of, that active listening is a part of developing empathy. And I think what we do in the humanities is share empathy, teach empathy, create empathy. And we do that by listening to people and respecting people's language. Um, the issues that I look at and how places change are, um, disinvestment, deindustrialization, gentrification, segregation. But when you come to meet someone where they are and to do an interview, you ask them, well, how do you feel about these changes? I forbid my students to use the word gentrification in interviews because I think it leads in a direction. So I hope we can talk a lot about language. Um, we are talking about the uprising, how we categorize it, what terms we use. In working with students, um, I really pull from the, the kind of idea of Jay Meckling, a, a scholar in American studies, that culture is the stories that we tell to make sense of our lives. Also, the wonderful work of Dolores Hayden in The Power of Place, her work kind of uncovering the stories of Los Angeles that were hidden and the voices that were hidden. But I want to make a point here that is really important that we do not, as scholars, give voice to people. People have voices. I can tell you the people we interview and work with have a lot to say. What we do, what we should do is amplify those voices. And by that, what I mean is bring those voices to new publics and to new audiences. The idea of putting these edited ideas together, working with students, um, we also work with, and I base a lot of what I do on Andrew Ross's idea in American, study, uh, American Studies of the, our practice as scholarly reportage. So you have in-depth investigative journalism and ethnographic methodologies. And ethnography, when we started this project, 
we worked with doing oral histories and ethnographic work, and then we also developed what we and the students called on the street interviews. And that came out organically of the practice of listening to people and how people wanted to talk and did or did not want to give their name. Um, so the, the complications of what we do, I think, is really important in listening to people. It's the most important um, act that we can do. I think if we're thinking about justice, that we need to, in public humanities projects, realize my kind of Two of my final comments, that the best projects are personality-proof, meaning you get lots of different voices, and those voices kind of come together, and they challenge what we think. And they seek out tensions, because if you don't seek out tensions, I promise they will find you doing work on mm -hmm. the ground mm -hmm. and working in cities. Um, so I think it's really important to, to, my final kind of thing on the title of what we're talking about, of the, the academy and the community, I think we also need to complicate what we mean by the community, because I think we have, number one, communities are diverse places with many, many different voices. Number two, communities are always not so nice and happy places. Communities are about, no, you stay out. Segregation, inequity, white supremacy. And also, as scholars, we are part of the community. Baltimore is my community. I live down here. So how, how do we negotiate that? So I hope we can complicate some of those terminologies as we have a great discussion. Thank you. Good Denise. evening. Uh, memory place and justice. Um, I'm Denise. Um, so this is so aligned to the earlier part of my day. We were at Douglas High School uh, having dialogue with the students about the Baltimore uprising. And two weeks ago, we had a community conversation about the uh, Baltimore uprising and a lot of uh, adults at the community conversation called the uprising a riot. And so that was one of the questions we posed to the students today. Was it an uprising for you or was it a riot? And then later on in the afternoon, we had a conversation um, with the teachers. Um, and that was really profound simply because uh, the teachers felt or they stated that it's been two years and no one has talked to us. And the contrast with, with today is that the students were very expressive, talking about place, their community, because we had them map where they live in the city. Um, they talked about race. They talked about being a target. They talked about um, protection of their families. They talked about uh, what they like about their community. It was all pretty positive. And the conversation with the teachers was very intense, mm -hmm. very sad. Um, the teachers felt disrespected. They felt like they weren't supported. And they were able to see the contrast. So in today's uh, sessions with the young people, we talked about justice. And I asked the, the young people, let's talk about justice. What is justice? We know the symbol of justice. and. We know the Constitution and things like that. We know some aspects of it. But trying to define it and understand it becomes something different. Even in my practice as a uh, cultural organizer, we've had conversations, attempted many conversations <coughs> on dare to imagine justice because we all see it differently. And so the question for me still is what is justice? And so a part of me through conversations in the community with other people, and I'll share a story about that that helped to kind of put this in my mind, and that an aspect is an aspect of justice mercy. And if, it, if mercy is an aspect of justice, why is it that African Americans feel as though we don't get mercy? So to share a story that, um, I heard in the community at a, a coffee shop. Young woman, she's a, um, she's a poet, very powerful poet. He had some other folks in the conversation. So she shared this story that kind of gave me this perspective. And the story is that teenager, they're out, and they're daring one another. And so her peers dared her to steal a car. She took the dare, and she stole a car, and she got arrested. So while she was in jail, there were some other people that were arrested too for stealing cars. And she mentioned that it was this a, a white 
teenager that was arrested for stealing a very, very expensive car. So in her mind, she said, I know he's really going to get some time because the car that he stole is, you know, humongous in comparison to the car that I stole. Well, he didn't get any time. And she did. As a matter of fact, her story is that she was put in foster care. Mm. And she cried to the audience, my expression cried because I kind of like felt her emotions. She cried to the audience, where was my justice? Why, where was my mercy? I'm sorry. She said, where was my mercy? He got mercy. Why didn't I get mercy? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to kind of go back to place. And place for me is Baltimore. Uh, born and raised, Native American, uh, I'm sorry, Native Baltimorean. I, I grew up in the uh, community, uh, St. Town Winchester, which is Freddie Gray's uh, community. That's place for me. Um, that's like, um, it's like my foundation. It's like I can walk in that community anytime I want to, and I'm at home. I know all of the alleys, I know all of the streets. So that's place and memory. And, as a cultural agent, as a community activist, uh, and interacting with the community, aspects of that is like when you come into the community, you're coming into my home. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure whether I want to welcome you because it's my home and you do have to protect your home because we do let strangers in our home and we have to be careful because we're not sure of, of their intent. So I talked about place in terms of, as it relates to community, people feel grounded and they have memories. And the reason why I love my community is because of all of the wonderful memories that I have growing up. The fact that uh, we interacted with one another, we knew the good, we knew the bad, we knew the indifference. Even now, in a community that has been labeled with a lot of very, very negative labels, I know the good, I know the bad, and I know the indifference. And therefore, I'm able to interact in all of it, in all the good and the bad and the indifference because it's community. You can kind of like compare it to family because in that, you have aspects of that also. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to stay with uh, you a minute, Denise, and maybe you could talk a bit uh, about how the humanities relate to justice and mercy. I'm thinking particularly that uh, the humanities, the, you, all of you mentioned the stories we tell, think about the arts, uh, the literature, the history, and the way that the humanities intersect with community. Do the humanities bolster? are different communities trust, or do they undermine it? And I'm also curious about the I Justice project and those images um, along with uh, um, both the uh, image and conversation, I think is how the I Justice uh, uh, project was described, um, around police brutality. And that seems to me to be a fertile intersection of humanities, community, and so on. So keeping with you, Denise. Um, I'm sorry, I was listening to you and then I lost you. Just say a little bit more so I can get back in my mind if you don't sure. mind. How the humanities Got can it. either bolster or undermine our different communities' trust. I, um, I agree with Nicole that listening is a huge part of um, knowing who you are relating to. And um, one of... Um, which is a partner, UMBC partner, um, Lee Booth. I remember when I first met him and we were trying to have, have a conversation because sometimes I do believe we talk around one another and not with one another. And I said to Lee, as an African-American woman, deep down inside, and this is also based on my experience and the work that, that I've done over, over the years and that's been service work and, and I'm a trained counselor, so I had to do a lot of listening, or oh, I have to do listening. And I, I remember saying to Lee, if you do not see me, you will not listen to me. And I think that is also rooted in story. 
If you don't take the time to hear what I have to say, you will never know who I am and how to relate to me. Story is so important. I know in growing up, the stories that my parents told us about Jim Crow South and uh, my, my dad telling stories about the war, it helped to shape us as, 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 as children and as adults, but it also gave us aspects of what our parents had to endure in their life and to maintain their dignity. So part of listening is, and part of storytelling is honoring Deep down inside, it is honoring and respecting who people are in their place, in their understanding, in their interpretation of their world and what's important to them. Nicole, uh, maybe you would like to talk a bit about the Baltimore Traces and the world that brought us Freddie Gray mm -hmm. and how the humanities uh, intersect with that project. Um, yeah, and I think I read a really good um, piece in the Baltimore City Paper on April 25th in their travel section, and it was uh, a young woman also from West Baltimore, Nia Hampton, um, and she, she, she was talking about travel, and she went to City College and got um, to take a trip to the Dominican Republic, and about there's a West Baltimore in every city, mm -hmm. just how to find it and how to find kind of find her people. And she was writing this piece from Colombia, and, and she said, I hope, you know, I, I find my people, but I know one thing, you don't go into someone's hood uninvited. Um, and I think that that's a really important um, kind of idea, is that especially, and I know Denise could speak to this post-uprising um, and my colleagues at UMBC, there's a lot of times where we have nothing to say. We have to listen. We have to wait for people to kind of to reach out to us to a certain degree. And the Baltimore Traces Project, it partnered with Mark Steiner, who's been working on the ground in social justice work in Baltimore for a long period of time, which was really helpful. Um, but the, the, the kind of most helpful aspect, I think, is this issue of listening and of respect. If people invite you, Denise invited us um, to her community a couple weekends ago um, to the public library there to have a listening session about this project um, that my colleague Denise Maringolo started. She was in Virginia and the uprising happened in Baltimore and she felt like she couldn't do anything but she has skills of a digital humanist so she created this um, online archive. Um, and, and the real thing, thinking about the humanities and how it can work on the ground with people, is we create things, but how do you get people? How do you get people, the, the people that matter, to kind of come and to share their memories and to feel comfortable mm -hmm. and to begin this kind of dialogue? Um, because I think you can listen passively and you can listen actively in, in a sense that um, in public humanities work that we take the work and we make it into something. We edit it together. Um, a lot of what we did in the Baltimore Traces Project benefited from scholars working with journalists because journalists have different methodologies that we can really learn from. Um, for example, uh, Andrea Seabrook um, was speaking to the students and she was like, wait, you're transcribing everything and then coding it on the transcription? Don't do that. That's a bad idea. You need to listen. You need to listen and pull the things out because sometimes it's not what people say, it's how they right. say it that matters. Kind of you were talking about mm -hmm. a woman kind of like crying out when mm -hmm. she was speaking. Listening is not just about the words on the sheet of paper. Um, and the students are like, great, we don't have to transcribe. And she's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you still have to transcribe. You just do that after like really critically listening. So they still have to do the work. And another thing that, that Andrea taught the students that I think is really helpful in thinking about the, the types of projects that we do is that when you're doing a project, you have to fall in love with your subject. And then you have to break up. And then you have to fall in love with your listener or your audience. And I think that that's a real difficult thing. That's the real ethics of, of the editing, of putting mm -hmm. things together for the public. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a really important process of what we do with public humanities work. We put it together, um, and then we bring it to people, and we say, hey, this is, did we get it right? Do, is, is, is this journalist would never do that. My husband's a journalist. He would never be like, this is article, right? <laughs> um, you don't do that. But we do that because that's the ethics of what we do. And people will say, oh, no, you got it wrong. So you go back to editing it. And that's a really important step. Thanks. Jack, I read an interview with a descendant of one of the enslaved people sure. whom Georgetown sold. 
and who said she was really glad to have learned her history. And I bet you've met some of the descendants, so I'm wondering if you sure, could talk a bit sure. about that. And I think my comments may also connect to a few things that, that my colleagues have already, have already mentioned. I, I, I indicated in my opening reflections that there were a couple of surprises. Mm -hmm. So we're not the first place that's had to wrestle with a building. Um, but we are one of the few places that we're wrestling with a building where we knew our whole history had it been well documented. And the first surprise we had was within our own community, how few people really knew the story. Mm -hmm. uh, that surprised us. I, I wasn't expecting when I sent out the letter to get back, I had no idea that Georgetown was somehow implicated. Um, but the second and the, and the biggest surprise, and I think it, I think it connects to some of your earlier reflections. Uh, we would not have presumed that a descendant community would have an interest in being connected to this work we were doing on our campus. Just to recall the facts, these weren't Georgetown slaves. The, these were slaves on plantations in Maryland. Georgetown's connection, our, our, our participation was we received some of the benefit of the sale. $17,000 was sent to Georgetown from the sale. The total sale was $115,000. And the down payment, um, of the down payment, $17,000 came to Georgetown to support what was at that time perhaps the most significant of the Jesuit projects in the United States. The, as we got into the journey, um, we had known some descendants because we had, they'd use our archives to be able to sort, sort through their own story. But the, the most extraordinary gift to Georgetown was that there were two evils in 1838. There was the sale of 272 enslaved children, women, and men. Second, against the orders of their religious superiors, families were broken up. And we recognized in this moment, the one thing we knew, we have records going back to 1730. Wow. The one thing Catholics do, we keep great records. <laughs> Baptismal certificates, <laughs> weddings, you name it, we got it. Mm -hmm. and, and the possibility of being able to help knit together families that did not mm -hmm. know their full history. And so um, when it emerged, and, and it, it was a real surprise to us um, that families now, 180 years later, would want to connect to Georgetown in this moment. Uh, but we viewed it as, as just an extraordinary gift to be able to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, the first step is I, I went out and I met with some families. I went out to uh, the state of Washington, and then I went down to Louisiana and visited three cities there. And, uh, several families back in, in uh, uh, the early part of last summer. And then we've had a flow of folks coming to campus. Uh, on April 18th, uh, we had a, a, a commemoration, uh, something we were building towards as one of the recommendations of our working group, just to give you the background. The working group worked from September 2015, and their formal report was presented in a, in a community meeting on September 1, 2016, uh, and their work was completed, but they left a lot of, of sure. um, uh, recommendations and actions that we then pick up. Mm -hmm. And one of those was a formal apology and a special event. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we had a liturgy of, of re remembrance, contrition, and hope, and then we had a renaming ceremony for the two buildings on April 18th. And we had more than 125 descendants come to be a part of that. And uh, wow. we had essentially two days of, of, of activities mm -hmm. and the like. But it was a, um, just an extraordinary privilege for us. Uh, the way, you know, just to perhaps make one, one more connection. Uh, the founder of the Jesuit order was St. Ignatius of Loyola. And the mission statement that he wrote for the society, in his own words, he concluded with the words, and we do all of this. And the last words were, for the common good. Uh, the common good, the idea that you know, together mm -hmm. we can achieve a good that none of us could ever achieve alone. Right. 
and we've interpreted that over the years as a university community that in addition to the work we do in preparing our young people for their, for their lives and supporting the inquiry, scholarship, and research of our faculty, a third element of the university is the responsibility to contribute to the common good of the communities in which we participate. And when I was together in a listening session we had with, a, with 125 of the descendants, after we had our celebrations and all of our ceremonies and everything else, we had a private session mm -hmm. where we, had, we, we, we came together and spent a few hours in conversation. And I concluded it by just simply saying, um, what all of you have now invited us into, because again, we would never have presumed it on our own, but we're now part of a community together, a new community. And a difficult community, I imagine, in some ways, but a community. But yeah. I, I would just say that overall, the, the experience mm -hmm. has been extraordinary. One tiny question before I yeah. open it up to audience. Were you aware of this history when you were an undergrad at no. Georgetown? No, but not long after. So yeah. I've been at Georgetown for 42 years. <laughs> I came as a freshman. He starts as a freshman, he ends up as president. Not bad. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would say um, in 1981, uh, one of our our historians right. uh, made a presentation at one of your association meetings uh, and presented the story of Jesuit slaveholding in Maryland in the early part of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And that's when it became um, more common. Right. And then we, ha we celebrated our bicentennial history in uh, 1989, and our bicentennial history captured this story. And then, as I said, in, in the 1990s, an American studies course um, that mm -hmm. looked at Jesuit slaveholding was taught by three colleagues, and in the context of that, right. produced a digital website. So what we're seeing, too, is a digital website. We're seeing uh, community engagements. We're seeing stories uh, uh, gathered, told, brought back interpreted, we're seeing artistic performances. So I think uh, what I might invite you all to think about is how the humanities intersect with our themes here of justice, of memory, and of community. So can, you can, have the floor can and- Can I just add oh, one piece? I'm sorry, go just, ahead. Just, uh, uh, in response to that point, um, uh, I, I, I teach a fall seminar, and in the fall I taught it, my seminar was on justice. And um, the, the third week of the class, we read Edward Baptist's new book, The Half Has Never Been Told. Mm -hmm. Ed's an, a Georgetown undergrad alum on the faculty at Cornell. And uh, it's an extraordinary book, capturing the links between slavery and capitalism. The, the scholarship that is being created right now in this generation of scholars on, on, on slavery, on racial justice, it is the most extraordinary scholarship that, that has been produced. This is one of those examples. We read the book in the seminar, and in May, knowing I was gonna be teaching it that week, I had called ahead to a colleagues at the New Museum of African American History and Culture. I said, you know, could we do, get a field trip? And you know, n not knowing, they didn't know what they were saying yes to, and I didn't know what I was asking, because the phenomenon of those early week, to this day, the average person is spending six hours at the museum. And, but this was the first week it opened, uh, one week after the opening ceremony, on a Sunday, I took the seminar uh, to the new museum, and one of the curators gave us a, gave us a, a three-hour tour, and, and we spent some extra time there. So the next day, we come into seminar, the next morning, and one of, our young, one of the young students in the class said, you know, I was with all of you yesterday for the tour. And she said, um, but let me tell you, on, on the afternoon before, I went down and I spent, I spent several hours at the Museum of American History, which is right next door. And she said, I cannot reconcile these two experiences. Join the crowd, right? So I, I just. <laughs> Good. Uh, Thank you so much. So uh, uh, comments and questions, please. And uh, we have uh, colleagues circulating with microphones. So just put up a hand. Um, Linda Green. American Association of Law Schools. Um, how do the humanities uh, contribute to the content of justice? So by that I mean that we're talking about justice, but what is its content? And there are lots of concepts, transitional justice, you know, questions of empowerment the philosophers might have, a view as a lawyer, 
uh, we have our own constructs, but uh, certainly the humanities contribute to illuminating the stories of people who have subjectively experienced injustice, but how do the humanities contribute to notions about the content of justice? So what is justice in the context of Georgetown or in the context of Baltimore? What does it actually look like and who defines it? Shall we start with Baltimore? Yeah, you know, that, that's a question that um, I've been trying to engage folks around and also to increase my understanding, I'm an African-American woman. So, you know, I've seen um, plenty of uh, things happen in Baltimore since I've been here and that has allowed me to question that whole concept of justice. Do I understand it? Absolutely not. So I'm still wrestling with it myself, but as it relates to the humanities and the cultural work that I'm doing and especially uh, working with the, the creative folks, the artists, we're able to illumin illuminate people's stories and what they understand, the good and the bad, even what we call the injustice, getting people to express that and explore that term, justice in America, because we believe, and I've come to believe some aspect of that, that it means different things based on race, economics, class, and gender. And I'd like to also challenge the academic community and how you use those words in setting up the categories that we deal with in our society, race, class, gender, and economics. Because in my community, it gets played out and people express that, well, because I live certain, certain place, then I get treated like different from people that live other places. Mm -hmm. I've had my personal experience in my own community, um, folks dealing drugs, and so, I'm a very active citizen. I believe that I have a voice, and therefore I can use it and, and try to do some things. So I call the police department and I give a description of what's going on. And, my, and the response that I got was, well, where do you think you are, in Rolling Park? And, and I said to, said to the officer, I said, you know, you gotta help me to understand that expression what does living in Roland Park have to do with me calling about the situation that mm -hmm. I'm concerned about in my community? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I went on to, well, I pay taxes, and we pay taxes, and we do this, and, and we do that. And I thought, as the uh, Baltimore City Police, that you're supposed to respond to our concerns. As a matter of fact, you've trained us to call you. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> <laughs> And so he, he didn't say anything. And of course, I had to kind of move the conversation forward with someone else other than him. But that is an example of categorizing. If you're not in a certain place, and, it, and you know, it could fall under the conversation of justice. If you're not in a certain place, well, you may get treated differently and, and, and get responded to differently. And, and, you know, investment happens differently. It's absolutely real. So the, the question about justice is, is something that we have to keep, I believe, exploring and, and evolve to understand it better, better than how we understand it and how we use it. Mm -hmm. Either of you care to comment on the oh, question? I, I'd just like to say I think that for, for thinking about Baltimore and where my research is located, it's always asking the question, what does a just city look like? And recognizing that's not one one singular thing. Um, and again, the practice g g comes organically. Uh, first project I did in Baltimore was in Brooklyn Curtis Bay area. I call it extreme South Baltimore, SOB, South of Bridge, which is annexed into the city in 1919. And doing oral history work, we would bring out a map. And we realized that a map really increases, um, 
what people have to say when you're interviewing them, if they have something physical, place-based um, to look at. So we developed over the years working with different colleagues and at UMBC um, this project that was funded by Maryland Humanities called Mapping Dialogues. And so we would take maps to communities suffering from deindustrialization and ask them, show us what um, places that you love in your community. Show us places that are problems. Let's talk about them. And, and we would offer some historical context. And really, what it ended up, our final mapping dialogue at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, the question was like, what do you deserve? What kind of city do you deserve? What kind of city do you envision? And what people were talking about um, wasn't really deindustrialization. It was um, Port Covington, a new development, um, which you might have heard about, Under Armour funded, that people are really you know, upset about. And so sometimes in finding what justice is, you, you define it by saying what it's, what it's not to a certain degree. And I would just point out, too, um, from a legal perspective, one of our like best historians of social justice is Garrett Power, who is um, a lawyer and who is very committed to looking that law can teach us. I mean, Baltimore City has some, some really messed up laws that we can look at and look at how they act on the ground in our city. Mm -hmm. So great question. Thanks. Thanks. The, the course that I was describing a moment ago I, it was actually called Contributing to, and I put in parentheses, IN Justice. So it's contributing to justice, contributing to injustice. And the way we, I, I designed it was that um, we wanted to make it as, as um, felt as affective an experience as possible. So it has a profound resonance with the way that you were describing it through, through novels, through uh, historical accounts. My academic training is philosophy. So I, we can go as abstract as you can imagine, but the intent was to be able to do this in a way that made these questions come alive in the lives of each student. And I guess what I'd say is on our journey wrestling with the, the question of slavery, memory, and reconciliation, uh, I would say it, we're, we're, our university is particularly strong in the social sciences. And I would remind my colleagues from time to time, there is no way we would be engaged at the level of conversation that we are if we didn't bring the humanities into this mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a beautiful synergy for us as a university community of bringing the two together. Hi, I'm Allison Reed with the Linguistic Society of America. I wanted to ask you about the intersection of language and justice. Mm -hmm. I was struck by the conversations you shared uh, relating to the use of the word uprising versus riot, um, the use of the phrase enslaved persons rather than slaves, and also, um, although you didn't refer to it, the debate around the use of the term refugee during the Hurricane Katrina uh, events in New Orleans and, and the concerns that Americans had about being referred to as refugees. Um, and uh, we're very interested in this question in our society. Our, our president's address at the last meeting was about language on trial and the role of language in the criminal justice system and how people's dialects and accents and other speech patterns can be used against them as both defendants and as witnesses in criminal proceedings. So I would be interested to hear your thoughts about the intersection of language and justice. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I know I bring a, a neighborhood flair to, to my presentation because I'm rooted in a neighborhood and I just like that. It, it feels good to me and I'm very comfortable with it and um, so I know that over the years it's interesting that some people may find it a little I don't know they've given me descriptive terms like oh you know your, your neighborhood girl and I go yeah I am <laughs> and so folks depending on um, maybe I'm gonna go back to honor and respect perhaps uh, depending on how they see other people in terms of respect and honor or as another human being, whether you're gonna reject them or accept them based on how they use language. I was watching a show on television uh, last night, uh, maybe some of you all are watching, it's called Shots Fired. It's on channel 45 and so it's about uprising and they talk about Baltimore a lot, but this is a, a plot show. 
uh, where there's an investigation um, and a uh, black boy was killed, a white boy was, was killed, and, and they're investigating. So one of the uh, investigators uh, states that, well, you know, we put this uh, person on trial as, as a witness, and she's poor, and her English language is terrible, and, you know, she's just not going to be credible. Um, so back to the example that, that you're talking about. And I remember um, the term that's used to describe uh, immigrants as aliens. And so when I hear the term, what comes into my mind as an alien is like a creature, not a human being. And um, so to take that back to people and to take that back to community, we find it very offensive. If you call me something that I'm not, I need to respond to it to kind of tell you, well, no, this, this is what I am and, and this is who, who, who I am. And depending on who's willing to listen, especially if you're bringing, you know, all of the movement and your dialect, I like to call it your dialect, your swag, that thing that, that's just, it's just a part of you. If you're bringing that uh, with you in, in your communication, then people um, may hear you, they may pay attention to you, they may not, but definitely you get labeled. One way or another, you get labeled. Mm -hmm. This is a great question, which I could talk about forever. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so important, but I go back to when we were at um, the library at Penn and North, uh, Denise and I and you were kind of running this discussion and there was a older woman who said, I don't know why all you white academics want to call this an uprising. If we're not going to do, get anything done unless you call it what it is, it's a riot. And she said, mm. you know, I, she, she was here in, or she was in D.C. in 68 mm -hmm. and in here, and she was brilliant and wonderful. And she really got us thinking about, and that's a huge debate. And I, you know, Betsy Nix, who was part of a, a project and has a public history textbook coming out, um, really has a great bit um, about the difference between riot, uprising, disturbance, who uses what term, um, why. And I tend to uh, um, think about the other thing that she said, the use of the term in 2015 from our mayor, and she wouldn't even say her name, but I'll say her name, uh, Stephanie <laughs> Rollins Blake, um, who called our young people thugs, um, and the harmful effect of that word on young people. There's a teacher from Frederick Douglass said we were doing things like, I am not a thug, I am, and having students reflect on that. Because words have so much power. And Barack Obama even used that word. Um, and it, we have to think critically about describing the, the children of, my, of our community in those terms. And working, that's why with, I was saying we don't use gentrification in interviews. We were working and looking at an arts district in Baltimore, the Bromo Arts and Entertainment District in the west side of downtown. And even that term of like how you call a place, because people from the west side of Baltimore would be like, this isn't the west side. You can't call it, this is downtown. This is east of MLK. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, so, you know, even the term in talking to people about, that's why we say, how do you, what do you call this place where we are, rather than putting the terms out there? Um, and uh, the director, I'm blanking on her name, who did the brilliant docu documentary 13th. Um, yeah, Anna DuVernay. She talked about the first hour of her two-hour interviews was just how do you define these terms? I think it's essential to the work we do um, to define our terms and to respect to respect what people want to refer to their experiences and their places and their selves, to respect that. Um, very intentional choice of words, um, and they were my choice. Um, I think if we go back and look at some of the materials from my colleagues, I'm not sure they were as explicit in describing it the way, but I have consistently, I, I, I need to go back to our Department of Linguistics and sit down with my colleagues and say, now why did I do this? But I'll tell you what I was thinking. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I was thinking. <laughs> I'll tell you what I was thinking. Um, it's a complicated story. So this building was named for a guy named Thomas Milady, a Jesuit who, of, in his era, was a, was a real giant. Um, our, our main building on our campus is named for Father Patrick Healy, a Jesuit, mm -hmm. who was the, the son of a uh, Georgia slave and her husband, uh, who freed her. Um, but he was a complicated guy. And, but Patrick Healy, uh, 
was our president from 1870 to 1878, and that building that has his name was constructed during those years. Father Healy's father, uh, in establishing a trust for the four children, the four Healy children, one of whom became the Bishop of Philadelphia, for the four children, in establishing the trust, the person he put in charge of the trust was Thomas Mullady. It's a complicated story. But when I talked about, when I spoke about this and I talk about it in different settings, what I try to emphasize is that even, even individuals as important as he was in his time lack the moral imagination to understand the responsibilities we have to one another. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if there weren't some, I mean, in an era where you had voices, abolitionist voices offering alternative perspectives. It's not enough to say, well, that's what everybody did or it was the norm. No, there was a lack of moral imagination to understand the responsibilities we have for one another. I just felt that it was more respectful to describe, it, to describe the individuals in the way that I did in the hope that it, might, it just might result in folks saying, why did he use those words? Mm -hmm. And why is he describing it that way? And the, the real challenge I think all of us face is, how are we contributing? The, the course was called Contributing to Injustice. How are we, either inadvertently or unintentionally, but how are we today doing, in our own ways, similar things to what my, these colleagues did on our campus and um, in the larger church in the 1830s? I see more hands. Those with That's the mics, please course. feel free to choose from the one side, middle, and the other side. So we, we give all sides a chance. I have, I have a not question. Not that you're divided politically. I mean, these are not the centrists. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they are. My name is Ashley Milburn. I'm a visual artist that tries to focus uh, around issues of uh, injustice and social justice. The um, story of Georgetown and what you had gone through is a story of academia, the repository of information that's almost like gold and unattainable to a certain degree, unless you have access to that, that source. But the model that you went through where information stored, cataloged, researched, uh, information has now access to um, a public that utilizes it and creates new things outside of the institution is a model, I think, for the humanities. But it's for all academic situations. I, I can recall uh, a young lady that was doing, I'm from Baltimore. Uh, I did a lot of work around the highway to nowhere. Um, but there was one young lady, I can't remember what university she was through, but she was doing a mosquito study. Uh, West Baltimore at that time had an issue with mosquitoes and the issues around health. And she described what she was doing. And, uh, you know, she says, well, we went around to the empty lots and we looked and lift up things and looked in, in containers and tires and we found the, the nests. And then we cataloged it and took it back. And I said, well, why didn't you turn the tire over to eliminate the problem that the community was having? And her response was, we can't do that. That's, we're not allowed to touch it. It's a study. I said, but it's a community. Yeah. And it's a community <laughs> infested with. So maybe there's a lesson broader that you can share with a lot of folks about the unlocking the box sure. that has the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Lippy with the American Society of Church History. And the Georgetown experience uh, triggered something of great uh, interest to me. Um, because as we see the injustice that we obscured in the past, how do we go about recrafting the story that we tell about the past yeah. so that we own the, the, the underside of it yeah. without letting that necessarily eclipse other dimensions of it? Sure. 
How can we bring that all together? I live in Charleston, South Carolina. We'd wrestle. Should we take down John Calhoun's, I see Calhoun's statue on Francis Marion Square, you know, because now we, we, I taught at Clemson for 18 years. His old plantation was the, the campus. You know, how can we own the, the, the negative injustice yeah. of, of the past while it, blending that with the, uh, the larger story so we do not lose some of the other parts of it. Woodrow Wilson would be a good example of yeah. that, for example. These are all great examples. And Thomas uh, Jefferson. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, I, I think the, the extraordinary thing that is happening right now uh, that all of us are the beneficiaries of is we have a new generation of scholars who are engaged in helping us rewrite the narrative, the American narrative, I mean, that comment of my students, I, I, I don't know how to reconcile these two stories. Well, we, we've got to find a way to reconcile these stories, or we've got to find a way to connect the elements of these stories. And, and we've got scholars like, like um, Alfred Brophy, who's, who's working out of, I think he's at Chapel Hill now, but really has studied the role of universities and their relationship to slavery in the South, the justification provided by universities and, and the courts. Um, uh, uh, Craig Stephen Wilder at MIT wrote Ebony and Ivy t three years ago. Very informative for us in our work. That was the story of, of the role of the elite Northeastern schools and their relationship to slavery. All of these are helping to illuminate elements of the story that were obscured in the past and we now need to integrate those elements into um, parts of the stories that we, we, we know and we need to connect. But I think right now, whether it's the filmmakers or the playwrights or the novelists or, or the historians, we are seeing an extraordinary body of work emerging right now that makes it possible for us to wrestle with your question. And this brings to mind the idea that the humanities must be constantly renewed and that our scholarly work and our teaching and humanities in, in the community are worthy of this renewal. And this, I think, and this may be a question uh, for the panelists, how do we convince the broad public that you don't read a book once and put it down or learn a history once and set it aside, but continuously, as these examples that you've all adduced show, need to keep the humanities reinventing themselves for these new generations. I don't know if anybody wants to take that up or, mm -hmm. or if that's just a statement, <laughs> but I wanted to make it. Well, I, I just would want to give you a sense of how high the bar is here. Um, when the sciences are under criticism because they can't get it right, um, because we're constantly revising some of our insights in the natural, the physical sure. sciences, um, th th this is a difficult environment in which to be able to, but it's never been more urgent, never been more urgent. And again, what, what, what you've identified is what I was trying to describe a moment ago, which is just where we are deepening our understanding with every new generation of work in, in, in the humanities. Right, it's and making. I think the projects that you two have uh, led or been involved with show that exact uh, uh, impulse, which is to um, study, take language, take stories, take lives, and ask what next, mm -hmm. and for whom, and by whom, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and you, both of you were in your comments about the communities that you work with and the students you work with, um, asking those questions. Uh, let me see, we still have time for one or two more, so. Um, I think we're on that quadrant. Or, or tur tur um, Susan Weiss, Johns Hopkins. Um, on Nicole's comment, uh, vocabulary seems to be a very important thing. Last summer, our incoming freshmen all had to read Kathy Eden and Luke Schaefer's $2 a day living on almost nothing in America. And we had breakout sessions with the faculty. The students used words like ghetto and gentrification. And... <laughs> It's very difficult. They're coming from all over the country, from different backgrounds. How, how, do, we, um, how do we teach them the new language? 
And I think it's uh, the, part of that question too is how do we learn the new language? Um, how, how do we do that and how do we teach it is what I grapple with every day. Um, and I think we make, we become aware of it and we become aware of what we've, we've said. And I go back to, the, I'm gonna use another one of your stories. <laughs> um, Denise talks, we talked about it, that, that wonderful um, meetup a couple of weeks ago, people would you know, come to West Baltimore and, and say, oh, you're, you're so disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And that would piss her off. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, do I look disenfranchised to you? <laughs> I do not, and does she know? Um, and so thinking about when you're trying to use the lingo that is maybe correct, um, but th that's why dialogue, that's why dialogue is the most important. Um, and you can say, like, I don't like when you refer to me. You can disagree with someone without being disagreeable. Um, and I think that that is based in dialogue. That's why, like, in the Department of American Studies, we've been very, we had our first summer hybrid course, but we've been very leery of online teaching because what we do is so dialogue-based. And, my, and another thing is to bring students, we just got this great, you're, you're at Hopkins, so you're already in the city. Uh, at UMBC, we're in the county, but we just got um, in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences a space, the Lions Brothers building, I'm teaching in the fall, I'm so excited, um, in the city so we can take students out. Because I think looking, walking, talking to people <laughs> seems so simple, but it's so, so transformative and so important of a critical oh, practice. That's how you figure out the language you talk to people. You talk to strangers, even. I continue to challenge the academic community because I believe she does. you all have created the language that people are using. Your, your research and, and your public publications have influenced uh, uh, how people use language and describe other people and um, describe communities. So back in 2011, the West Baltimore has, again, a lot of uh, negative descriptions. So in 2011, Culture Works, we worked on the ground doing cultural organizing and found some partners to support us, and we had a national festival. So West Baltimore is described as all of the negative variables that's been researched in behavioral science and public health, so on and so forth. 10,000 people descended on West Baltimore that weekend. All of the negative things that were mentioned, 10,000 people came into West Baltimore to enjoy culture, mm -hmm. connect with one another, have dialogue. And the city of Baltimore was really surprised we had to pay for extra police <laughs> because the thought was that people were going to take people's cars, all kinds of crime was going to happen and no crime happened. We had to pay for special lighting because it needed to be illuminated. <laughs> Even the officers had a good time. <laughs> it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was absolutely magical. And so that caused me to, well, the intent of doing that was to highlight place. We, 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 we named it Remembrance, Healing, and Celebration. So we remembered the history of, of West Baltimore. We celebrated the history of West Baltimore. We did the healing aspect in, in terms of talking about what had occurred over the years in West Baltimore. So we just didn't have, have the... Uh, Huge celebration. But back to um, using language, academics using language to describe things and to, and to describe people. And then I like to say, well, whose narrative are you describing? Are you taking what your life is, you know, where you live and how you think about it, and comparing it to other people's lives? And if you're doing that, well, what, what's real, what's cultural, what's human about that? Your life is your life. Other people's lives are, are their lives, and then there is cause and effect. So I always go back to when people are using the term disenfranchised, ghetto, uh, so on and so forth, my response is always, whose narrative are you talking about? Because that's not my narrative. My narrative is not ghetto, not disenfranchised, not poor, 
None of those things is a part of my narrative. So I have to ask the question, whose narrative are you talking about when you're writing? Mm -hmm. And just keep that in mind. Who are you really writing about? And why are you doing so much comparison? What is at the root of that? That's my question. And that is the humanities question. Mm -hmm. Whose narrative? Who are you writing for? And what voice are you mm -hmm. speaking? Please join me in thanking Jack Thank and you. Nicole and Denise for a very Thank stimulating you. panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>